Hello, YouTubers, and welcome to episode 630 of the Daily Comic and Collectible. Today, the collectible of the day is the Hasbro Toys, Marvel Legends series, Symbiote Suit, One Sixth Scale, Spider Man Action Figure. Spider Man gets an all new look when he finds a sleek black costume in a space shuttle wreck. Little does Spidey realize he's joined himself to the predatory alien symbiote, Venom. This 112 scale action figure of Spider-Man in his black suit is inspired directly from the Marvel Comics line of characters. This 1-6 scale Spidey can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with any Hot Toys action figure in height and features intricate detailing and hand-painted deco with superb sculpting. This Legends figure features ultra articulation with over 30 points of articulation for some serious and intense poses in your Marvel display. This figure was exclusively released for Target stores and box contents include one symbiote Spider-Man figure, two pairs of alternate hands, and a highly detailed alternate head sculpt. Comes in a collector's friendly window display box and was released in 2017 by Hasbro Toys. Now, the comic of the day is Marvel Fanfare, Volume 1, Issue Number 42, with a cover date of February 1989. This issue again contains two stories, and today I'm covering the main story by Carl Potts, with art by Carl Potts, and cover by Terry Shoemaker. This story is titled, Windfall. The story opens with Spidey in his regular cloth black costume. He's in a good mood as he web slings around town on a Thursday afternoon, despite the oncoming rain. Though his rent was paid with a rubber check, Spidey is confident he'll avoid eviction this month with some non-Spidey pictures of the mayor after a helicopter crash into the Hudson River. Daily Bugle City Editor Catherine Cushing pays Peter standard rate for two pictures and offers rate and a half for pictures of Margaret Thatcher scheduled to arrive at the UN in 45 minutes. Responding to Peter's need for his paycheck, Catherine rushes a check request. As Peter races past Betty, his ex-girlfriend notices his black undies are showing from beneath his split jeans. Betty insists on safety pinning his pants rear shut. So with his check in hand and pants finally pinned, Peter heads to the bank. Peter ends up drenched in the rain, waiting in line to get in the bank. Since he lacks an account at this bank, Peter is directed by a nice teller to the manager for his signature. Rushing over to his own bank to deposit the cash, Peter realizes that the nice teller who hurried to help him at the other bank gave him an extra hundred. While pondering his ethics, the teller closes, and Peter decides to return the money the next day, to make sure the lady doesn't get in trouble. So Spidey rushes off and successfully takes the pictures of Ms. Thatcher, though losing his safety pin, covering his rear in the process. The next day, Peter is paid and goes back to the first bank to return the extra $100. Though the bank was closing, Peter asserted himself to get in and give back the money. The manager Simon Johnson was appreciative of Peter's honesty, but when Pete goes to see the nice teller he had the day before, Simon tells him that he fired the inept twit. He throws out her file right in front of Peter. Feeling guilty for her termination, Pete picks the teller's address out of the garbage after Simon leaves. Checking out the file, Pete notices Simon threw out a business card from an escort service. Later, 
Spidey swings over to the apartment of the teller, Doris Cannon. Outside her window, Spidey overhears Doris's landlord, Mr. Holden, complaining that the rent is three months late. Knowing also that she was just fired, he evicts her and her two children, unless she can come up with $1,600 in a half hour. Doris explains that her husband ran off on her six months ago, and she's been working night and day for the daycare. But the words fall on Holden's deaf ears. Spidey debates if he should lean on the landlord, or if he's shirking what he really needs to do. Heading over to the ATM, Spidey withdraws $1,500 from the two checks he just received. At the ATM, a little boy notices a big hole in the rear of Spidey's costume. Spidey sneaks the money into Doris's apartment. When Mr. Holden returns to evict Doris, she's shocked to miraculously have the money. Holden gives her a week to get the remaining hundred dollars. Now, with the teller's rent paid, the first aid has been applied. So Spidey swings off for the corrective surgery. At the escort service hotel, that just happens to be the same address as Marvel Comics, Spidey patiently stakes out Simon. There, his automatic camera captures Simon, as well as pictures of himself with his behind exposed. The next day, Simon receives photos with a letter threatening to release the pictures to his wife and bank president if he does not cease harassing female employees and rehire Doris Cannon. While Pete watches from the ceiling, Simon complies and offers Doris her job back. After Simon burns the file in the men's room, Peter decides to burn a photo of Spidey with his rear end exposed, taken from his automatic camera, choosing dignity over selling the picture and paying the rent. These stories are continued in Marvel Fanfare, issue number 43. Geek Fact This issue is considered a key issue for its backup story of Monica Rambeau as Captain Marvel in a solo story battling Count Dracula. Bonus Geek Fact Marvel Fanfare features characters and settings from throughout the Marvel Universe, and it includes stories of varying lengths by an array of creators. The title was published every two months and ran for 60 issues. Cover dated from March of 1982 to December of 1991. It was edited throughout its run by Al Milgram, who also wrote and drew an illustrated column entitled Editory Al in some issues. Marvel Fanfare's original working title was Marvel Universe, which was later appropriated by Marvel Editor-in-Chief Jim Shooter for the encyclopedia series The Official Handbook of the Marvel Universe. Marvel Fanfare was envisioned as a showcase of the comic industry's best talent. Each issue featured 36 pages of material with no advertisements and it was printed on magazine-style slick paper. It was more than twice as expensive as a standard comic book. The Editory Al Hi gang! Today I'd like to discuss the subject of unsolicited submissions. You see, since I'm a freelance editor, when I'm not editing an issue of fanfare or frantically trying to keep ahead of my many freelance deadlines, I like to relax. But friendly, well-meaning folks keep sending in samples of their writing or artwork. Oh, I'll usually glance at the drawings. As for the story ideas, I've only got enough time to feel guilty about not looking them over. 
But when I stop and consider the sincere effort, dedication, and the long hours spent producing these samples, well, I realize there's only one way to handle them. McLaren, burn this stuff. These people are after my job. Yes, boss. Seriously, send your stuff to the submissions editor or one of the full-time editors. Thanks, Ed Al. And final geek fact. The Daily Bugle is an American tabloid newspaper based in New York City. It operates from the Daily Bugle building located on 39th Street and 2nd Avenue. It was once one of the most read newspapers in the United States of America. In the 1930s, Scoop Daly worked for the Bugle, and he and other journalists working for it often became involved in the vigilante The Night Raven's Adventures. A man named Jameson worked for the Bugle once almost catching a picture of the unmasked Captain America. This man later served as an editor, directing C. Thomas Sites. He served as publisher in 1945 when the Daily Bugle printed a story alleging correctly, despite official denial, that Captain America and Bucky had been lost at sea. The longtime publisher of the Bugle, J. Jonah Jameson, began his journalistic career as a reporter for the Bugle while still in high school. Jameson purchased the then floundering Bugle with monies obtained from assets, inherited, and turned the paper into a popular success. Other magazines published by Jameson from time to time included the revived Now Magazine and the now defunct Woman Magazine. The newspaper is noted for its anti superhero slant, especially concerning Spider Man, whom the paper constantly spears as a part of its editorial policy. However, the editor in chief, Robbie Robertson, the only subordinate to Jameson who's not intimidated by him, has worked to moderate it. Well, I'd like to thank you for joining me for another Daily Comic and Collectible. And I hope to see you again Friday. This is Kurt Van Comics Man. And I'll catch you on to flip, baby. Over and out. Mm-hmm.